all of college, all of college from Indonesia and overseas. And here are our speakers from Indonesia, Prof. Jin Wiguna, Dr. Brihastami Savitri, and Dr. Leslie Merisa. And also good afternoon for Professor Norman Sartorius. Thank you for joining us today. It's an honor for us to have you here with us today. And good afternoon from Geneva, Prof. Norman Sartorius. We eagerly want to learn so much from you. And hello, my name is Sewa Mariam Kautama. I am psychiatric resident from Universitas Erlangga, Indonesia. And I am also board member of IPTA or Indonesia Psychiatric Training Association 2020 and 2021. And also today I am the chair of this meeting this afternoon, this evening. And thank you for the opportunity that given for me today in this big event. International webinar that joined event from Indonesia Early Career Psychiatrists and Indonesia Psychiatric Training Association with the big theme, Building Resilience Through Existentialism, Idealism, the Reality, and the Capacity in Transition Era Among Psychiatrists in Low and Middle Income Country. And the special theme for this third webinar is Psychiatrists from Low and Middle Income Country and Contribution for Global Mental Health. So today we will learn and discuss together about how can we give contribution and role as the expert in mental health, especially from low and middle income countries in making a positive impact in global mental health. And also how we adapt in this transition situation from the third year of the pandemic and how to deal with some issues that arise from it. And we have two presentations this afternoon from Dr. Leslie and Dr. Prihastami. And then we will learn and get inputs from Prof. Jen Wikuna and also for, from Professor Norman Sartorius. And then we can continue it with the discussion. So let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Leslie Melissa. Dr. Leslie Melissa, she is a psychiatric resident in Universitas Indonesia. She had experience in student executive board when she was in university. And also she's an awardee for some scholarships. And Dr. Leslie, you will have 10 minutes for your presentation. And the screen is yours, please, Dr. Leslie. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sheila, for the very kind introduction. First of all, I'd like to greet Professor Norman. Good afternoon, Professor. And also good evening to Professor Jean, Dr. Mia, and my beloved seniors and colleagues in the audience. Um, it's a great honor for me to be able to be invited today to speak from my humble experience. I hope that everyone is in good health and still have some energy left um, after a long and hard day at work. So let me first share my screen. Uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot share my screen. And try now, Dr. Leslie. Okay. All right. Okay. Can everyone see it now? Okay, um, so the topic of the presentation today is about psychiatrists from global mental health and their contribution for global mental health. Uh, sorry, psychiatrists from low and mid income countries and their contribution for global mental health. Actually, I think this is quite a heavy topic as there are many points to cover, but I'll try to focus on just a few that I find interesting and important. So firstly, I will share how I ended up studying global mental health and then also some information about learning and research opportunities. Next up, I will talk about what I've learned from mental health professionals in Indonesia, what, ha what they have done and what we can do in the future and then end it with some final thoughts. Okay, um, so during my final year of medical school, I got to spend one month at National University Hospital and the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore. I took part in their community outreach program called REACH. It stands for Response, Early Intervention and Assessment in Community Mental Health. So every week I would accompany the psychologists to schools to assess uh, children who are referred to by their school counselors, usually because of emotional or behavioral problems. Um, and then after the assessment, we will go back to the hospital to discuss the case with uh, consultants or the psychiatrist uh, in order to formulate a treatment plan. Then the intervention will take place at either the school or uh, for most of your cases, the child will be invited to the hospital for further treatment. 
at that time, I thought to myself that this is such a great program and it would be nice if we could adopt it in Indonesia. However, I later realized that there are so many differences between the two countries, starting from the size of the country, the number of the population, the healthcare insurance system, human resources, and so on. And that was when I started to do research on what I wanted to study after graduation. Um, and that's how I chose to study global mental health at King's College London and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. For the program itself, there are 10 modules in total, divided across three terms. So in term one and term three, we have uh, three compulsory modules to take. And then in term two, we, have, we can choose up to three electives out of a broad range of modules. For global mental health itself, as you can see from the topics here, it includes many, many things. If you are passionate about mental health issues, I'm sure you can find it in global mental health. Um, the overarching goal of global mental health is to ensure mental health for all. And in order, in order to achieve that, we need to learn from each other, not just from north to south, but also from south to north. And there are criticisms that global mental health is just another form of neocolonialism or another venture between psychiatrists and pharmaceutical companies trying to introduce psychiatric drugs to more people. However, having studied the subject myself, I don't think that the claims are true at all. We were always taught that it is imperative to be sensitive to and consider culture and local context when trying to establish uh, new projects. So all in all, I think that Global Mental Health has actually done quite a good job in raising awareness about mental health all around the world. So if you're interested in learning more about Global Mental Health, here are some uh, opportunities that I found, starting from thought and research programs besides KCL and LSTM. You can find it uh, at the University of Glasgow, University of Lisbon in Portugal, McGill University in Canada, and John Hopkins in the United States. Uh, for past courses and webinars, uh, here are some from last year. The first one is, is in Goa, India, and then this one is from Universitas Gajah Mada, uh, Center for Public Mental Health. And this one, well, this webinar is from McGill University, and I think it's still ongoing. They are adding more videos each year. As for free resources, I'm sure you can find many on the internet as long as you know the keywords. Here are two channels that I subscribe to, and uh, these are books that I recommend for learning more about global mental health. Okay, now we will now see uh, some of the initiatives that have been made in Indonesia and their challenges. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list because uh, there are many more movements out there that I could not mention one by one here today. So uh, the first one is uh, the setting up of community-based mental health services in Aceh following the, uh, the 2004 tsunami. So the main objective is to integrate mental health into uh, the province's primary health care system. One of the challenges of this program is that a lot of funds and resources were primarily used for short-term relief and support rather than allocating a portion of the funds uh, to strengthening the existing mental health system. So unfortunately, after a year, only a few agencies remain in the area to sustain the program. And then the second one is, this one is widely known at the global level, Indonesia free from PASUM. Obviously, uh, the, the objective is to eradicate the use of physical restraint or PASUM as it's called in Bahasa and help them get the proper treatment. One of the biggest barriers to this program is the geographical barriers such as long distance to uh, primary health care centers and also the availability of transportation. So providing transportation would be to and from uh, primary health care centers could be one of the solution. Then there's also the issue with um, continuity of care and also um, the curative model of mental illness. So people are still expecting that mental disorders could be cured once and for all. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, maybe one of the solutions is to keep educating that people to people uh, that although mental some of the mental disorders cannot be cured, but it's manageable and people can still lead a normal life. Third one is uh, the ongoing efforts to integrate mental health care into primary health uh, system. Um, so I'm not sure of the progress up to date. This one is from 2014. Uh, but I've actually been getting help from the general practitioners working at the center. 
uh, on the other hand, I've also received reports from patients saying that uh, some medications are not available at the center and uh, yeah, um, that the clinic is not open every day. I think uh, those two are, are, are problems and that we need to overcome. So what can we do in the future? Uh, here's just some food for our thoughts. I think first one, we could scale up effective programs because there are many programs out there that have been proven to be effective, but efforts to scale them up are still lacking. And then secondly, we should keep collaborating with other mental health professionals. And as we know that religion plays a very important part in our people's life, maybe it's time to formally engage uh, those religious and spiritual healers. And while it is good to develop new programs, Maybe sometimes it's better to improve what we already have, for example, by adding mental health components to maternal classes or the PKPR for adolescents education. And I think that mental health promotion and prevention should also be increased at the school level and also workplaces. Uh, so to sum my presentation, I would uh, sum it up to three steps is that to ask, connect and collaborate. First, ask yourself, what are you passionate about? And what is important and needed to be done in your area and then find people that you can work with and then yeah, work on the project and learn from each other. Um, I really love this statement from Professor Vikram. Uh, he said that we don't need to travel far to work in global mental health. It may just be as close as our backyard. So what I understand what from his words is that each, of what, each one of us can contribute to global mental health by helping everyone we meet our family, friends, and especially our patients to maintain their mental health. After all, global mental health is about all of us. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Leslie. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation and very open eye. And I just like your statement that ask, connect, and collaborate. And we hope that we can collaborate uh, in the future. And just for information, Dr. Leslie is graduate from Universitas Indonesia, from medical school in Universitas Indonesia. And she also graduate from King's College London for the Master of Science of Global Mental Health. And also she has a few of works experience in psychiatric department of Universitas Indonesia. And a lot of organization experience also. And thank you very much, Dr. Leslie, for your presentation. And now we proceed to the second presentation from Dr. Priyastami Savitri. And let me introduce her, Dr. Priyastami Savitri. She's a psychiatrist and also the lecturer in Universitas Airlangga, Surabaya, Indonesia. She's also worked in Sutomo General Hospital and also Universitas Erlangga Hospital. Right now, she is a fellow in medical psychotherapy in Universitas Indonesia. She has so many awards, just like a WPA three minutes competition as the first winner, and also has a lot of publications and experience in some organization, including Indonesia, Early Career Psychiatrist as Commission of International Affairs. Dr. Priyastami will have 10 minutes for presentation and the time is yours, Dr. Priyastami, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction by Dr. Sheila. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the committee. This is uh, really an honor to be in the same forum as uh, Prof. Uh, Sartorius and also Prof. Chin. Uh, I hope from my 10-minute presentation, uh, it can be a trigger for future, uh, further discussion uh, so that we can understand more uh, how we can contribute for global mental health. Okay, these are the things that um, the committee asked me to discuss for tonight. So what and why GMH or global mental health? As we understand that from the Global Burden Disease Study, the neuropsychiatric disorder attribute for over 10% uh, from the global burden disease. 
And also, the mental, neurological, and substance use disorders are the leading contributors of years lived with disability. From the physical, social, and economic burden of mental illness uh, is very great, but the WHO's Mental Health Atlas found that the median number of mental health workers globally is nine per 100,000 uh, population, which is far from ideal. And it is extremely different from the low income to the high income countries so that we can have uh, uh, an image of how different uh, from the low income to the high income countries. So the GMH involves study, research, and practices of improving mental health for people all over the worldwide. And this is very, uh, very, very um, uh, in line to the theme of our uh, world mental health uh, theme for uh, the last two years. And also we have to take into consideration the disparities in mental health treatment and care across cultures and countries. Okay, uh, the first exposures on mental health issues for me uh, is when I spent a year as an AFSR, uh, an exchange student to Australia, uh, as uh, is, it is common to have a culture shock. But I'm very um, glad and very thankful that I have so many uh, support from the AFS itself. Uh, for example, there are liaison officers, there are family meetings, there are support group and counseling services, uh, apart from the um, support that they give. So uh, that is my first exposure on mental health issues. And throughout the medical schools, I'm uh, very amazed on how our uh, biological uh, condition, our chemical uh, uh, conditions can uh, improve, uh, can um, correlate to our behavior and also how our behavior and also our feeling can uh, closely correlate to our um, physical well-being as well. Uh, and also through uh, my early career as a GP, I work in, in an oncology uh, hospital. Uh, there I, uh, I found it um, more and more obvious how important uh, the mental health is for our quality of life uh, and also for uh, our prognosis as well in uh, the cancer patients. And it became more obvious after I started practicing. Uh, here you can see uh, I have practices in Surabaya, which uh, uh, one of them is the, the one of the biggest uh, hospital in Indonesia. Uh, so they have uh, many patients from Eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, we have uh, quite advanced uh, approaches, but I also have practices in Tuban. If you see here, uh, it's about uh, three hours away, three hours drive away from Surabaya, which is where I am now. Uh, uh, it's quite a rural, a rural area. Uh, that have very, very different cultural um, epidemiology in terms of the patients, the language. Uh, and also uh, here I realized how the cultural competency and cultural sensitivity play uh, a bigger role in our practices. And also we found that the service delivery in limited resource settings are uh, very different to Surabaya. And this is what maybe our friends in other parts of Indonesia uh, may found uh, even very different from what I found because still Tuban is part of Java, uh, one of the most um, developed island in Indonesia. But uh, imagine our friends in different islands. So um, the disparity and also the uh, how, how is it different from the ideal that the maybe the high income countries uh, approaches that we read through our journals and also from the seminars, the webinars that we found is not always applicable to how we practice in, uh, in our daily life. Uh, apart from the epidemiology and cultural and geographic context, of course, uh, as uh, for example, in when they have, um, uh, they have different, um, different um, characteristic from the people in the um, coastal areas and the people from the uh, 
from more of the outback where uh, where they're still um, uh, in, in, like closer to the jungle and everything. Uh, and also the health systems and policies are very different as well because uh, the local government and also the uh, our universal coverage system is also play uh, a bigger role in how we uh, provide the services to our uh, patients. For example, how the um, how the the uh, the availability of the certain drugs or uh, uh, and also um, and also because of the limited uh, number of psychiatrists. So uh, there are also very limited um, time available for our patients. And also the access to the treatment and care. As we imagine, some of the people come from like hours away from the, uh, the center of Tuban. So uh, of course it um, influences how we provide our services. Not to mention the ethic and human rights that's supposed to be uh, universal across the world, but it's not always the uh, case uh, in the in where we practice and also uh, so uh, this is um, this is some of the things that the global mental health um, curriculum is uh, in need because we have to address the education and also the supervision of the non-specialists as well so what are the uh, available opportunity to develop ourselves uh, I would like to share uh, from my experiences, um, because there are lots and lots of opportunities um, that uh, that can help us uh, expose to the global mental health. For example, uh, when we uh, when I had the chance to uh, be a part of the uh, fellow, uh, ECP, the Early Career Psychiatrist Fellowship Award in the uh, in the Egypt, we had a, a very interesting discussion, of course, with the uh, with the certain countries. We probably have several similarities with us in Indonesia, where the majorities are Muslim. Uh, and also, um, when uh, we had when I had the chance to be a part of the Indonesian approach to transform adults and health uh, in the NCD prevention. Uh, in Indonesia, which has a uh, co uh, collaboration with the uh, Australian government, we uh, we realize how the the center of the NCD prevention is actually mental health. So that's uh, how important our role is in the um, in the not only global mental health but also the global health. Uh, and from the community mental health training in uh, Bangkok, uh, we also learned that there are a lot of things to catch up in Indonesia. Uh, we found that we have we are not that far away from Bangkok, but uh, there are there are lots and lots of uh, mental health system that can be approved uh, can be improved, um, uh, and that is uh, our homework, I guess, for the early career psychiatrist. And of course, I have to mention the uh, the chance for uh, early career psychiatric leadership course. Uh, which is um, pioneered by uh, our professor Sartorius, uh, of, because um, not only the the, the 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 course itself, but the networking, the friendship that we develop with our friends from uh, around the globe, uh, expose us more to the global mental health and what we can do uh, here in Indonesia. Um, also, um, lots, of, lots and lots of uh, chances for us to, uh, to present our, um, our researches over here, uh, even, though as, uh, even though it is very simple. For example, when I, um, when I have the chance to be invited as a speaker in the Colombia, I'm oh, sorry, for the Honduras um, uh, a seminar, uh, it opened the, it opened a discussion. Like several, um, several of the, um, the 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 audiences uh, sent me emails on how to uh, set up their own like uh, counseling unit because I was presenting about the counseling unit. So even though we found that uh, 
our presentations are probably very simple compared to the higher income countries because of our limitation, but it actually uh, contribute more to some of the other uh, people in the other countries. Uh, another example, when, we, uh, when I present um, a paper in uh, Bangkok uh, about the telepsychotherapy uh, in Indonesia and how uh, the perception of, of, of psychiatrists about the telepsychotherapy, uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the audience from uh, Africa just started uh, their telepsychiatry services. So, they learn a lot, a lot from what we have done here uh, because we do have several limitations that are similar uh, because uh, because we come from the low middle income. Okay, so um, other things that we can do, of course, be part of the global mental health societies and have collaboration in the researches. And also, uh, Prof. Satorius always said that we have to nurture our uh, network. We have to keep watering the plant. So correspondence is very uh, important in this case. Uh, of course, we have the ECP uh, from the WPA section, and also we have the trauma from the uh, WPA uh, section that uh, we can join, and also the education interest group uh, that will expose us to how we can probably develop the global mental health curriculum in uh, our countries. Uh, and also recently, uh, I am very honored to be, uh, be part of the Middle East Plus Brain Initiative that uh, will have our um, second uh, meeting in, the, in Bali uh, as a part of the uh, G20. Uh, we call it the N20 because uh, it's a uh, neuropsychiatrist 20 initiative. And also uh, other thing is like the early intervention and in mental health, but there are lots and lots of uh, other societies that we can uh, join and learn uh, to uh, improve, to contribute more to the global mental health. Of course, we have to uh, think globally, but also start locally by integrating leadership practices, advocacy, and building partnership. Uh, so I'm just going to share uh, several things that I have the chance um, uh, to um, contribute more to the uh, uh, to the local mental health, uh, for example, as, uh, as a public relation, um, uh, uh, public relation um, head in the in, in the hospital in our university hospital, I have uh, a lot of chance to um, to raise awareness on the mental health issues. Because as we know, uh, the stigma and the stigmatization are still nowadays. And also, uh, as the Medical Faculty Counseling Unit, uh, I think this is one of the things that, uh, that I consider contribute uh, significantly because uh, we are also aware that a lot of the stigma around the mental health uh, issues come from the uh, from our fellow um, medical or phys fellow physician. So uh, I think this is uh, the chance we uh, raise uh, awareness on how important the mental health uh, as a part of the uh, medical, uh, or, or for the medical uh, education. And also, uh, I feel lucky to be a part of the uh, IPE, Interprofessional Education and Interprofessional um, uh, Collaboration uh, in our university, where we, de uh, we, we develop several modules. Um, and most of the modules actually uh, emphasize on the importance of uh, mental health. For example, they have modules on geriatric, patient safety, and also like um, uh, substance abuse. Uh, Etc. But all of them have the uh, have mental health incorporated into it. So I think that's a, a good start on how we can start locally. And also, we are very lucky to have a book collaboration uh, from se uh, several of our colleagues uh, from other uh, specialties. Uh, for example, 
on HIV, tuberculosis, and COVID-19, where we uh, highlighted the role of the mental health in our uh, patients' management. And also not to uh, forget about volunteering itself by uh, through community service, uh, because, uh, for example, uh, closest island to Java is, uh, one of them is Madura. Madura. Uh, we, they have like a very different characteristic, different language, uh, different resources as well. So that's how we learn more about the cultural uh, competencies and also cultural sensitivities. Uh, other part is uh, through online uh, volunteering as well, such as uh, health medicine or through the uh, support circle ID for support group, uh, support group uh, efforts and also uh, we can start through journals and also uh, magazines. Uh, for example, um, in our uh, in Surabaya, we have a magazine called Doctor. So, as one of the editor there, uh, we uh, I feel that I uh, can contribute more on mental illness by by uh, by by continuously reminding them that uh, in every uh, in every uh, every uh, every edition that there are always uh, mental health uh, issues uh, that can be explored, uh, even though they have different kind of um, theme for every edition. And also, I am a part of uh, the EDTV Surabaya uh, for. Uh, EDTV is uh, is an association of the Indonesian doctor in Surabaya who have um, uh, who have programs for lay people uh, through uh, by becoming a part of the EDTV uh, team. Uh, I can also give ideas on uh, what um, topic or themes for that month that can be. Uh, raised uh, for the lay people and also uh, me, the, sorry yeah. uh, maybe the time for yeah. one minute uh, more okay thank you dr shela uh, and there's of course there are other kind of effort that we can do for example the disability service unit for uh, which is a collaboration with different universities and also our university um, also uh, develop a, an academic peer list because uh, Prof. Uh, Norman Satore has always uh, emphasized the importance of mentorships. Uh, this is uh, one of, uh, this is the last uh, slide. Uh, this is just a kind reminder that as a psychiatrist or a future psychiatrist, we are blessed with myriads of opportunities to contribute for better global mental health. Every contribution is meaningful as there are no such thing as meaningless actions. Sometimes it is as simple as trying to understand touching one life at a time. And at most time, it started from the smallest goal, like by taking care of our own mental health and by learning more about ourselves. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward for discussion with uh, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Shela. Thank you, Dr. Priyas Tami or Dr. Mia for the opening presentation that you introduced to us, the diversity of Indonesia, the obstacles and also the opportunities. And thank you for the kind reminder for us. And I would like to say hello and good evening for Prof. Norman Sartorius. Thank you, Professor, for joining us today from Geneva. It's an honor for us to learn and to have you today. And now we proceed to the responses. And the first response from Professor Chin Wiguna. And I would like to introduce him for the first. Prof. Chin Wiguna. Uh, Prof. Jin Wiguna, he is currently live in Jakarta and he is a professor in psychiatry department of Universitas Indonesia and also he is a lecturer in psychiatry department of Universitas Indonesia and also Cipta Mangun Kusumo Hospital. He is a child and adolescent psychiatric consultant. He graduated for medical doctor degree from Ukrida Jakarta and psychiatrist and also child and adolescent consultant and also doctoral program from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. 
and then he graduated from Master of International Mental Health from University of Melbourne, Australia. He did so many research and has so many publications that you can find it online. And for Prof. Chin Wiguna, the time is 10 minutes, Professor, and the time is your Prof. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sierra, for your nice introduction. So good evening, Professor Sartorius. So how are you? I think I also learned so much from you as well in this uh, 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 few decades. So this is a very interesting issues to be discussed this evening. Firstly, I would like to say thank you so much for this invitation. I think uh, this uh, wonderful evening, so I am really feel honored to get involved in this discussion. So um, you are, I mean, it's both of you having a very nice presentation according to the global mental health. So the topic that we would like to discuss this evening is also very interesting. So you are talking about building resilience through the existentialism, idealism, and also the reality and the capacity uh, in the transition era among psychiatrists. So after I heard all presentation, then I remembered one issues that I ever read uh, during the past few years, I think. So the WHO uh, mentioned in the last more than 20 years about the transforming mental health for all. So the transforming mental health for all, uh, I mean, is the heart lies a call to change how we promote, protect, and care for mental health. So the call to transform mental health and uh, mental health care is not new, basically. But uh, I think that uh, uh, in the last few decades, so there is a lot of arguing. I mean, it's especially for services reforms. So growth in global activism is in recent years has focused uh, a, a political attention on the need for the quality mental health care. And especially that recently the COVID-19 pandemic put both the value and vulnerability of mental health under the spotlight and exposed a huge gap in mental health system all over the world. So I think that it is very interesting, especially we are living might be in the low uh, middle income countries like Indonesia. So uh, I think as a professional in mental health, not just in mental health, I think in a multiple sectors and also the general public mental health and also people at, as, as mean of the community also, uh, I mean, it's experience increasingly recognize the importance of mental health during this, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic and more policymakers than ever understand and publicly support. So this is really the imperative for improvement. So I think uh, uh, WHO in 2021 also uh, recommitted to the Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan 2013 until 2030 and also provides WHO, I mean, it provides a roadmap for improved mental health structure around the 10 global targets. But uh, this type of express commitment can only take us so far. So driving the mental health agenda uh, forward the effect meaningful chain also requires institutional uh, commitment, policies, plan, and programs to implement the stated intent. And then, uh, 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 we do understand on the, I mean, it's WH, WHO report on 2020, they mentioned that 67 countries' uh, data, they, uh, they, they reported that only uh, spend 2.1% of their total health budgets on mental health. And this number is very, very small. So how we can improve mental health? So, I mean, it's this evening, uh, uh, I mean, it's discussion might be a need to be focused on how to shift to community-based care. Uh, I mean, it's long advocated by the WHO and others, and this is not happening fast enough. So there is still a wide gap between those needing quality care and those receiving it continues to exist. So we need to be more, I mean, is uh, uh, having a strategies. So the WHO, uh, WSO report, they put the three key strategies or path to transformation. So the first that we must deepen the value we give to mental health as individuals, communities, and governments. 
and match that value with more commitment, engagement, of course, and also investment by all stakeholders across all sectors. And second, we must put as well, reshape the physical, social, and economic characteristic of environments, better protect mental health and prevent mental health condition. So third, we must strengthen mental health care so that the full spectrum of mental health needs is met through a community, through a community-based network of accessible, affordable, and quality services and support. So I think uh, as a, a mental health leader, so uh, you are a young psychiatrist and also might be uh, become a subspecialty in one day. So have the uh, major responsibilities to strengthen mental health care so that it is respectful, provides dignity, and supports autonomy. So during your study, of course, you learn a lot. But when you are going to practice a real as a psychiatrist, then you have a lot of challenges. So especially in tackling the stigma, you already mentioned about the stigma, and also strengthening right to eliminate abuse of people with mental disorders in general and mental health services is particularly important. And as a mental health professional, you also have a duty to help assure more equitable care for population who are less likely to seek help or are less likely to be offered quality services or for whom the risk of missing or misdiagnosing mental disorder is known to be higher than usual. So in our countries might be, uh, I mean, it's uh, not only in our countries, basically in low middle, uh, com in low middle income countries. So there is a lot of minority that including the, uh, of course, the et ethnic minorities and also many other, I mean, is a minority uh, person, migrants, refugees, and also person experiencing poverty and homelessness. I think this is a challenge in our country. So that's why uh, for you as a commitment, as a young psychiatrist, I think these issues need to be focused. So your presentation is very nice, I think. You learn a lot during your study, and now you have a lot of, I mean, it's, uh, 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 opportunity to look about what is uh, going to be changes uh, in your own self after you being a psychiatrist, how you provide yourself with a new knowledge to expand your skills and also your uh, professionalism. So uh, one day you might become, uh, uh, I mean, it's a good uh, uh, a psychiatrist or a good consultant that might help uh, to improve Indonesian people mental health. And uh, we might be equality with other uh, 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 high income countries. Thank you. I think that is my uh, uh, perspective after, uh, I mean, is sharing both of your presentation. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your perspective. And thank you for reminding us for how challenging our journey as we graduate from school and then the opportunity for us to contribute for our country and also for the world. Thank you very much, Professor. And I remember for the participant that you can ask questions and you can text chat in a chat box and also when we do the discussion, you can raise your hand. And now we proceed for the response from Professor Norman Sartorius. First of all, I will introduce him, but I think all of us know about him. Hello, Professor. Good evening. And Professor Norman Sartorius. Professor Norman Sartoris is former director of Division Mental Health of World Health Organization. He was uh, elected president of the World Psychiatric Association in 1999, and he was elected president of the European Psychiatric Association and currently the president of the Association for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs and also member of the Geneva Prize Foundation. He has so many achievements and publications that you can Google it. And Professor, uh, the time is yours. You have 15 minutes, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to see that the initiative of uh, 
getting together every so often is continuing. And I hope that uh, these first three uh, uh, meetings which you had uh, will continue and will become a habit rather than an exception. And uh, I think I want also to thank the, uh, uh, my colleagues, the younger colleagues who have made the introductory presentations. I think they made a number of uh, very interesting and important points. And uh, the uh, facts, I'd like to come back to some of them because I think they are important. Let me start with the notion of uh, uh, global mental health. And uh, there is a feeling that people say that the global mental health is something uh, new, that there is another style of working about global mental health and so forth. Well, in fact, global mental health is uh, recognizing that mental health problems are universal. They are in all countries of the world. Uh, the global mental health also means that uh, we have to somehow join hands to deal with this. It's not going some other place, as Dr. Patel has mentioned, uh, that you can do global mental health next door. The, 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 the problem is really that we have to think of uniting ourselves on one hand with uh, other psychiatrists in the same country and in other countries. And in the presentation by uh, Dr. Savitri, we have seen a number of opportunities for uh, establishing contact with others. And I think that you should never be shy of writing to a person and asking for a contact. If you see a paper that is particularly interesting for you, uh, you should write to such a person and say, I'm also interested in this topic. Uh, you will find that some of these letters will never get a reply. But even if you write uh, five letters and one gets a reply, it's a lot. And uh, I think writing a brief letter is not such a big deal. And having a contact established in some other colleague in your own country or elsewhere is extremely valuable. So I think that, uh, so the first statement about global mental health is that global mental health is a recognition that mental health problems exist in all countries. Global mental health is also the notion that we have to work together in order to deal with this problem. These are the two features which are common to all of us. They have also been recognized by the uh, United Nations Assembly as being one of the sustainable development goals. So these are the, this is the elementary part of that. Now, we should also seek collaboration with others, not only with other colleagues in psychiatry, but also other people, because so much in the field of mental health cannot be achieved by psychiatrists. Uh, it is other people whom we have to involve, engage, mobilize in order to work with us, in order to get anywhere. If you want to improve child mental health, you have to work with schools. You have to work with mothers and fathers. You have to think of ways in which you can connect to perinatal care, because the mother, the expecting mother is very receptive. She wants to listen to what you have to say. And you could in fact improve the mental health very greatly if you thought about perinatal mental health as being a priority area for collaboration. And one has to therefore understand that the future of psychiatry is not within psychiatrists, but it is within our capacity to link with other people in the community, elsewhere, other officers, other people who will help us in doing something about mental health. The actual job of treatment, mental illness, is only a small part of what one would like to see for the promotion of mental health of a society. We are now suffering under the uh, several major trends that are present in uh, most societies of the world. One of these uh, trends is the trends of commercial mercantilization. Mercantilization or commoditification is uh, the notion that everything is measured by its economic aspects. I think it's good if it brings money. A hospital is working well if it makes a profit. Uh, people who uh, have money will get better treatment, etc. Everything in the field of health is gradually turning into a commercial proposition. And that is, of course, a major problem because so many of the people who have mental illness don't have money and they are in fact at the bottom line and have to 
uh, have hardly money to survive. So one of the major problems that we have to think about is how do we provide mental health care despite of this trend of uh, seeing everything as a commercial proposition. Another problem that we are facing, uh, which I think we have to address is the problem of fragmentation of medicine. Medicine as a whole has been uh, over time more and more split in ever finer parts. So that uh, you now have, previously you had internists uh, and then now you don't have an internist anymore. Now they are cardiologists and uh, hepatologists and uh, phrenologists and uh, endocrinologists, all sorts of small disciplines. The discipline of internal medicine has split into a number of places. But the same is true also of psychiatry. Previously, we had one psychiatry, but now one psychiatry is exploding into very small pieces. We have now child psychiatry, which speaks only to child psychiatrists, and adolescent psychiatry who don't want to speak about others, and old age psychiatry who are only dealing with elderly people. Forgetting that human beings live together and that thinking about health of an individual cannot be done by isolating the problem and dealing with only one of the problems that may be present. So that's the second problem which we are facing now is the fragmentation of medicine. We can do something about it. We can, if we are in the business of education, we can think of ways in which we can produce education about medical problems collabor in collaboration with others. Um, but it could also improve ourselves a little bit more. Now a psychiatrist, when he discovers a case of a, a med a med mental disorder, he will deal with that problem very well. But what happens when a psychiatrist finds himself in front of a patient who has a mental disorder and a renal disorder? What does he do? Does he now provide treatment also for kidney disease? No. He now says, well, I am dealing with a mental disorder and somebody else should be dealing with the other disorder. And uh, the current situation is such that the number of people with comorbid mental illnesses is continuously growing. More and more, a greater and greater proportion of all people whom we are seeing have more than one illness. And we have to think of ways in which we can deal with all of the diseases in an individual who is in front of us. One way is to establish what has been called collaborative care, making an arrangement with other colleagues and regulately, regulately um, connecting with them so that when a patient comes who has a mental health problem, but also a physical problem, you know how to send him if you need advice uh, to another person and how to treat that disorder as well. It would be also helpful if psychiatrists did not forget that there are also general doctors and that for many physical illnesses, they can provide treatment as well, rather than reject the treatment that is happening. The third problem, which I uh, think is very important, is the problem of urbanization. Urbanization is now everywhere. Uh, I think that Jakarta is now the greatest city in the world. Uh, it has a uh, surpassed uh, everything, including uh, uh, the Tokyo Yokohama uh, constellation which was considered to be the largest. But bringing people into towns means many things. The one which is very important is that normally urbanization breaks uh, communities. There are no communities. People who come to town very often are, don't know each other. They live next to each other, but not together. And so the ideas that we had previously of community care is facing a major problem because there is no community. The communities which previously existed in villages uh, where everybody knew everybody and you could speak to the village head and he would help you, does not exist anymore. You are having now towns uh, in which people live in the same house and they never know who they are. In a country like Argentina now, 95% of the population lives in towns. But even in countries which are uh, not as long a history of development as Argentina, urbanization is massive. 
So it does produce, on one hand, a difficulty in working. We have to have new strategies to work in towns. The original strategy of community health and community mental health must be adjusted to the town situation, a very difficult task. So those are three big problems which we are facing. The problem of excessive emphasis on money and commercialization, the problem of fragmentation of medicine, falling into ever smaller disciplines and not working together any longer, and the problem of urbanization, which changes the surroundings in which we are working. We are not any longer working a, a, with a communities that exist whom we have to convince or think, we have to think of other ways of doing this. Now, so much for uh, uh, the, the problems and uh, issues that we are facing. But I think some of the things that uh, Dr. Savitri mentioned were very important, seeking collaboration and everywhere to bring things together. Dr. Chisholm, when he was founding the World Health Organization said, there is no health without mental health. This is very nice to say, but it's very important to indicate that and bring this into the operation very early on. And I think that it's time that we think about of new alliances that we will create within uh, our working place. How many of you have gone to the school to meet who the teachers are, to see who these people are? They are bringing up children. Uh, do we know what they are like, what their school wants to do? I think that these are a terribly important information which one has. Now, in the last few, maybe 10, 15 years, there is a new emergency, a new problem that has emerged that's particularly important. And that is the problem of health of carers. That is the wives and husbands, fathers and mothers, children and others who look after people who have a mental illness. If you have a small family, uh, if the husband falls ill, the wife will have not only to work outside of the house to get some money in, but also look after that sick person. And the same is true for the elderly. As they live longer, many of them, in fact, reach the age in which dementia is frequent. So they sit there in the house, somebody has to look after them. The families have reduced their size in many places, not everywhere, but in many places. So there is nobody to look after them. And the carers become excessively demanded. They have to do an enormous amount in addition to their work and bringing money into the house. They have to look after their children, after their sick members. And the consequence of that is that many of the carers are having a syndrome of burnout. They can't do it anymore and they reject it and they want to do it. And we have to think of what can we do for carers in order to maintain services running? Because we are not doing the services, we are giving advice. We are giving advice to the carer and to the patient. So that our thinking about that must be very much. We know that carers who have somebody in their charge have three to four times more physical illness than other people who do not have somebody who is in their care. We know that depression and anxiety is about 40% more often present in carers than in people who do not have anybody in their care. We also do not have, uh, we haven't paid enough attention to this. And so the carers, they burn out and they're overburdened and they give up. And now we have not only the patient who is without anybody to look after him, but even the carer who requires help. And the problem of thinking about this is very, very relevant, particularly in countries with low income. Because until now, all of the services were resting on the shoulders of carers. And now they're sick. Now they're burned out. Now they run away. Now they are in town. What do we do about it? So you have before you, I think, as young psychiatrists, a number of big problems. All of them have a solution, but the solution has to be local. It has to be adjusted to the place in which you work. And it's not for everybody that you will find the solution, but for many you will, provided that you see the novelty of the situation which exists and the way in which such a situation can be, can be corrected. I think that the emphasis on 
linkage with other people, with other families, with other disciplines, with everybody else as a permanent task that you would take on is very important. I would say that maybe one third of your time as a young psychiatrist should be spent in linking yourself to other people who can work together with you in dealing with your problems. And that is a task which requires patience, it requires skills of uh, working, it requires a lot of good heart, and it requires a change in our professional identity. We are not anymore the ones who know everything and can do something. We are just one chain, one part of the chain, and the link which we are establishing will help people and make them feel better. So this is what I want to add to what has been said already. I'd be happy if you have any questions or comments, I'd happy to hear those. And uh, uh, I, as I said earlier, I do have hope that the future we shall have, or you will have similar meetings regularly, and that they will be serving to identify problems, but also to identify talent, which is so often present and not discovered in your colleagues and friends. Thank you so much, Professor Sartorius, for the insightful responses. And thank you for reminding us to do collaboration with others. And the three big issues that you mentioned before, the commodification or commercialization, fragmentation of medicine, and also urbanization. And we move to the discussion. And we have uh, two questions in the chat box. And for the participant, if you want to uh, ask directly, you can use the raise hand in your reactions and then you can open my for later and i will read the question in the chat box from leonardo laleno doctor uh, thank you dr leslie and dr priastami for the comprehensive presentation in terms of climate change and its impact of mental health what are the role of a psychiatrist residents and other mental health practitioner in prevention educating and the society and implement the concept of a responsible citizen. Thank you. Maybe the first from Dr. Brihastami. Thank you very much for the question, Dr. Leonardo. Uh, in my opinion, um, first and foremost, we have to teach ourselves, I mean, expand ourselves about uh, the importance of the climate change and also uh, its relation to mental health, which is uh, there are some journals, some researches has already been performed, and uh, I think it's uh, very important for us to be familiar with the issues and also uh, learn more about the issues. And also the second, uh, we can be part of the research as well, like uh, because uh, we understand that in Indonesia, the climate change probably not uh, something that um, our society really concerned about they're probably more concerned about how they eat tomorrow. So uh, I think um, uh, understanding how our society uh, perceive the climate change can help us uh, to be a part of uh, the change as well. And also um, uh, by learning more, we can uh, incorporate the climate change into our psychoeducation to our patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, um, I believe that uh, we, as we also learn that the climate change really correlates with our mental health, uh, I think uh, in doing our parts in terms of the climate change uh, can make us feel good, feel better about ourselves. So I think uh, uh, that can, uh, as, a, as a citizen, as a psychiatrist, as a part of the citizen, that can uh, be our motivation to do more about the climate change. I hope uh, it can uh, give some answers to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bresami, for the answer. And maybe we move to Dr. Leslie. Please, Dr. Leslie. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sati, for the question. First of all, I'd like to say that I think that I'm actually very lucky to be able to study at Universitas Indonesia because uh, the curriculum here is, at, is very comprehensive and uh, our teachers have always tried to be flexible and accommodate us during these tough times. Um, personally, for me, maybe I'd like to have 
some sessions for self-analysis formally included in the curriculum because sometimes I find it hard when encountering difficult patients. Um, of course, we do have supervisions, but maybe I was hoping it would become a part of a routine program. Um, and considering our, how, how jam-packed our schedule is, I think it's difficult to put in more, um, put in more programs, but maybe we, uh, we, we can discuss it with our teachers later on. And maybe um, I'll also like to learn more about leadership and advocacy skills. Um, those are the skills I think that are important for us in, in order to be able to collaborate with other mental health professionals as well as other people. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Leslie, for the response, maybe. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Leonardo Laleno, Dr. Leslie. I will read it again about the question. The question is, in terms of climate change and its impact of mental health, what are the role of psychiatrists, residents, and other mental health practitioners in prevention, educating the society, and implement the concept of responsible citizen? Thank you. Maybe the response you gave before is for the question from Dr. Sati, and maybe we will discuss it for later, Dr. Leslie, and maybe you can give the response for the first question from Dr. Leonardo Laleno before the question from Dr. Sati. Do you have any difficulties for the question, uh, the chat box maybe? Is there okay, any problem I'm, I'm in really your chat sorry box? For that. Yeah. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. I think I missed that one. Uh, okay, Dr. Leslie. Maybe I'll, I'll think about the answers first before I respond. Okay, uh, maybe. Uh, response from Professor Chin Wiguna about the question from Dr. Leonardo Laleno about climate change and what are the role of us as residents, psychiatrists, and other mental health practitioners? Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Shelly, uh, uh, for uh, the conducting this session. So thank you for Dr. Leonardo. Uh, I mean, it's uh, Dr. Leo. So your uh, question is very interesting. So first of all, uh, I think that we need to understand the potential impact of climate change uh, in our uh, public health or also included the uh, mental health. So we often see, especially in Indonesia, according to the changings of climate, like extreme weather. So we also have flooding. I still remember a few years ago, there is 1.8 meter flooding in front of my house. So we need to evacuate to other, I mean, it's dry places. So it is really, uh, I mean, it's impacted uh, our mental health. And also I am as a psychiatrist, also very stressful that time. So I think uh, the mental health consequences, there is a lot of issues that we need to, I mean, is taking care according to the stress, anxiety, depression, and also the post-traumatic stress. I think that might be uh, the impact of climate change in our mental health. So of course, uh, we need to increase our coping behaviors. So I mean, is uh, uh, and also uh, uh, need to increase the resilience. So how can we as psychiatrists or residents and also uh, other mental health professionals? So psychiatrists, residents, we are also categorized as mental health professionals. So what is the important issues uh, here is we need to help uh, people. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, it's set up uh, prevention and also the promotion of climate change uh, 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 program to the, I mean, it's to the, uh, I mean, it's the impact of climate change to the mental health. So the, I mean, it's the promotion and also the prevention program might include the psychoeducation uh, according to how to uh, increase the resilience, how to cope with stress, uh, both individually and also a, a group as a community. So I think it is all of our responsibility, I think. And we do understand as well that changing the behavior, changing the understanding of the community, not is not, I mean, it's not only a one year or two years program, but of course it's need a sustainability program. So we need to, I mean, it's uh, help them to understand, help them to taking care about themselves and also their families. So both individually and group. So uh, then we need to advocate the government 
uh, according to these important issues. So that's why I think that this uh, work need to be uh, consistently and continuously because uh, we do understand that uh, uh, Indonesia is, uh, I mean, is located in a very highly uh, extreme of climate change. We all have a lot of volcano. We have a lot of, I mean, is uh, a different, different, typically geographical uh, 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 situation. So that's why I think uh, uh, we can act for this climate change. Uh, I do hope that this might answer your question, Dr. Leo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Chin, for your answer and responses. And I think we look to Prof. Norman Sartorius. I wanted to make a comment about improving teaching in psychiatry for psychiatry. Is that okay? It's okay, Prof. It's okay. It's okay. And I think that there are several uh, ways in which we can improve the uh, training of medical students and psychiatrists without increasing the budget for it. One of the elementary things that we should start thinking about is that certain parts of training in psychiatry cannot be done by teaching only medical students, but the medical students should be together with nursing students, together with social work students, and together with any other people who are working on the mental health. They should be trained together because when they are spending time in training together, they will learn to respect one another. At present, the respect is very low. Uh, doctors very often don't think very highly of social workers or of psychologists or of nurses or anybody else and vice versa. And I think that joint training in, a, in the undergraduate level is something that can be done relatively che uh, cheaply and quickly. Number two is the any teaching that is being done about the psychiatric topic should be taught not only by the psychiatrist alone, but by the psychiatrist and the general practitioner or a psychiatrist and an internist, and we should demonstrate to the student that in fact, it's the collaboration between different disciplines, which makes a difference. The third point I think of great importance is that we should also honor and uh, help people who know a great about mental, deal about mental illness to teach. Uh, for example, it would be extremely useful to bring in to a medical student class or to a psychiatric class for that matter, a parent who is looking after a child or a son who is looking after a mentally ill father to talk about ways of looking after people at home. It's something that they know much better. They would be pleased to teach about that and we would accept some humility about our advice, which we are normally giving so richly, do this, do that, do this, something else. They know very well and they can teach us a great deal. And finally, the fourth simple, all of this is without any extra express in money. Uh, the one which I think is also important is the systematic teaching of what is called communication skills. We should teach people how to speak. We should teach people how to negotiate, how to convince. Uh, we should think of people how to prevent burnout in your team. All these are skills, social skills, which can be learned. They are easy to learn once you want to do it and are immensely helpful for the, both for the doctor and later on for the psychiatrist. So those are the four simple things that one could introduce without any extra amount of investment, without any reforms, except for the reform of your own thinking uh, about how training should be done. And I think it's something that you might wish to consider at a local level with some students that you have to teach maybe, or at a level of the institution in which you join others in teaching, et cetera. All of these yeah, are doable, provided that there is goodwill about it. And I know that some people are doing it already. Joint teaching is becoming a habit now, but it's far from universal. And I think it's still something that we should be improving and increasing. Thank you, Professor, for the insightful perspective for education of the psychiatrist. And maybe uh, we proceed to the next question that uh, the 
uh, already given response from Dr. Leslie and Prof. Norman, from Dr. Sati Rajasi Tanggang. Uh, thank you for the clear presentation, Dr. Mia and Dr. Leslie. And Dr. Sati will give question for Dr. Priyastami. First, from your point of view, as a young psychiatrist, as well as a lecturer, what should we do to improve our capacity as a young psychiatrist regarding to our psychiatric training in Indonesia? As we all know that we only have nine centers for psychiatric training in Indonesia and still need more psychiatrists to cover our country with more than 280 million population. Please, Dr. Priyastami. Thank you very much, Dr. Sati, for your question. I will try to answer uh, part of your question, but of course, uh, at the end, I will need Prof. Chin to, uh, to help me the question. The question. Okay, uh, in my opinion, uh, first of all, we have to uh, learn and understand our limitation as well. So we cannot um, uh, do everything uh, by ourselves. So uh, that's what uh, Prof. Satori has always emphasized. So uh, maybe part of the things that we can do is developing a TOT, a training for trainers. So for GPs, for nurses, for uh, lay people or for uh, volunteers, so that we can work together in uh, closing the gap uh, for the mental health in Indonesia. And also uh, we uh, we probably should um, learn and spend more time uh, to set up a good rebel system that probably need to be improved over time uh, uh, so that uh, the GP can also uh, help us uh, to uh, give mental health services uh, to the, to the, uh, to the more um, people who need it. And also, uh, appealing to the um, medical students uh, about the uh, importance and also the exciting uh, world of psychiatry. I think that would be uh, a good idea as well, because, uh, so that more and more uh, medical students would uh, try to apply as a uh, psychiatry uh, resident. Uh, and also, uh, I am lucky that uh, our university has developed some uh, uh, some programs. I think uh, it's very uh, correlate well with what Professor Torres has already mentioned. Uh, because uh, as a lecturer, I don't only teach uh, medical students. I teach uh, other uh, students from uh, other faculties as well. Apart from the IPE, is not uh, not only for the uh, for the health branch of the uh, of the faculties but also for uh, all other faculties and we also have a, a class that uh, is um, uh, for uh, for a mixed um, students uh, from different faculties uh, they got together for a class for the communication skills that Prof. Torres has already mentioned uh, which has so many uh, aspect of uh, psychology, psychiatry, and mental health, of course, indeed, and also, uh, also a collaboration class. And um, uh, and also, I think, uh, to, to, def to improve our capacity, I think it's also uh, very relatable for us to learn uh, more from the social media as well, uh, to help us keep up with the current issues, uh, and how we can uh, raise awareness on uh, the mental uh, aspect of the current issues. Uh, I think uh, that's in my uh, opinion. Uh, I'm sure that Prof. Chin and also uh, Prof. Satoris can add more to that uh, question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brasnami, for the answer. And maybe we proceed to Prof. Chin. Please, Prof. Chin. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So uh, yeah, Dr. Sati question is very interesting. So I am also a, a member of Indonesian College of Psychiatry as well. So talking about the centers, I mean, is the uh, residency, psychiatry residency training centers in Indonesia, you are right. We only have nine centers across Indonesia. I do understand that it might not, I mean, is uh, enough for uh, our total population. 
Yeah. However, uh, we need to remember as well. So in Indonesia, we categorize the health services and also including the mental health services into three category. The primary health, uh, I mean, is services and also the secondary and the tertiary. Of course, for the secondary and the tertiary, so it might be, I mean, is served by the psychiatrist or the consultant. So the primary might be the medical uh, doctors uh, give us, uh, I mean, it can give or, or can deliver the services. So of course, uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, 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 answering this question. So we already, I mean, it's make some different competency between medical doctor competency in psychiatry and also specialist and the subspecialty. So uh, I mean, it's uh, uh, doing this, we do hope that the mental health services can be covered across Indonesia. Because uh, of course we do understand we cannot generalize the whole Indonesia into one kind of mental health services. Uh, for example, in Java Islands and compared to the Papua Islands, that might be different uh, population, different cultures, and also difference in uh, uh, mental health needs. So that's why I think that we need to, uh, as I mean, as part of the Indonesian colleague of psychiatry, then we need to, I mean, is uh, 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 help uh, every province that can provide the uh, psychiatric residency training. However, the problems in the human resources. So uh, your question is really insightful for me as a member of Indonesian colleague of psychiatry, how to make a strategy to, I mean, is uh, improve uh, every province that might have the a university or the faculty of medicine might be uh, help them to improve their uh, standards so that might uh, have an opportunity to set up the psychiatric residency training. For example, like several years ago, several, uh, I mean, is a, a, a department of psychiatry in some of uh, a, 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 a area in Java. So, uh, I mean, is uh, try to send their uh, uh, staff to our university in uh, the Faculty of Medicine University of Indonesia to be, uh, I mean, is psychiatrist and going back to their uh, hometown and set up the psychiatry residency training. So I think in the near futures, of course, uh, uh, we need to make a more, I think, uh, uh, a strategy how to do this again, uh, and then uh, might be uh, several other uh, 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 human resources in every province have that kind of power to set up the psychiatry residency training. So hopefully we can fulfill the number of psychiatrists and also the consultants, because I also read the second question from Dr. Salty. So how about the uh, consultant itself? Yeah, we do understand that the consultant is also the university-based training right now. So no wonder it should be the full-time training for two years. So yeah. We do understand about how difficult for, uh, I mean, is psychiatrists in, uh, I mean, is a, a remote area or other province to come to Jakarta and then uh, uh, doing the two years uh, uh, consultant training. I think it is not easy, but uh, I mean, is you are, I mean, is sacrificed to spend your two years. I mean, is learning the consultant in psychiatry might be very benefit for the people where you are going back to serve in the new futures. So thinking about that issues, I think that uh, 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 you mentioned about how difficult is, is it, then yeah, we think that we also need to make some uh, 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 consideration how to make this kind of training is more affordable and how to make this kind of training is easily to reach for uh, other psychiatrists in, uh, I mean, it's outside Jakarta. So now I don't think that I might get the strategy directly, but I think that I might answer it in the near future, I think. Because of course, this is not an easy question because, uh, I mean, it's, uh, 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 yeah, for the geographic context of Indonesia and also for the, I mean, it's a, a curriculum itself and how we need to, I mean, is uh, uh, maintain the competencies of the consultant or the psychiatrist. It's also very important because we would like, I mean, is uh, uh, the Indonesian colleague of psychiatry already set up the competency that should be fulfilled both for the consultant and for the spe specialist itself. Then that's why we need to maintain this because we would like to have the Indonesian, I mean, is uh, uh, a psychiatrist or the Indonesian subspecialty in psychiatrist 
have a, I mean, is a, an international I mean, standardized competencies. So we can, of course, uh, be equal to uh, other countries uh, and also equal, especially in the Asian countries. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sati, for your insightful question. So I think that I might answer your question in the next future meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Chin, for the answer and also the perspective for the second question from Dr. Sati. And I will read it first. Dr. Sati, give second question. Thank you, Prof. Sartoris, for insightful input for us in Indonesia. We have advanced training to be a consultant psychiatrist, which is university-based for two years, which we have to leave our work to be full on the training. And it will be challenging to a young psychiatrist who wants to pursue consultant program in psychiatry when she or he is the only psychiatrist in the hospital or the area. Would you like Please share how consultant program in psychiatry in your country or in any other country that you know well. Thank you. Please, Prof. Norman, for your perspective. Thank you, Prof. Well, there are. I think that the uh, the, the problem of you, if you have nobody, no psychiatrist at all. Uh, if I understood the question well, is it is a. Uh, how do we train people when there are few training spots or could you just clarify the question a bit? For the second I question. I'm quite sure I understood the question, how it was. Uh, Dr. Sati asked, uh, would you please share how consultant program in psychiatry in your country or in any other country that you know right. well? Because in Indonesia, we have to, uh, go to the university base for two years and we have to leave the work and how if we only the we are the only psychiatrist in the hospital thank you Prof. yeah well the countries are extremely different and not only in the system of training but also in the names that they give in some countries you become a psychiatrist when you start working in a mental hospital that is the first day that you enter into the mental hospital, you are called a psychiatrist. Uh, in other countries, the training will last up to seven years. For example, in the British uh, system now, you have to spend seven years uh, in order to, to get to a particular level. Uh, I think that the most frequently seen level is uh, now to have a approximately three-year basic training in psychiatry. Uh, of uh, with a possibility of subsequent specialization in uh, one of the subfields of psychiatry, child, child psychiatry, old age psychiatry, uh, etc. The various sub uh, creations have been done. Uh, unfortunately, although the European Union has created a, a special committee which is looking into ways of simplifying and unifying the, the training. Uh, they still have not sufficiently uh, defined uh, what would be the best and most acceptable training that should be uh, given in all of the countries. My own sense is uh, that a country like Indonesia will have to develop a training in psychiatry that is appropriate and uh, adjusted to the situation in Indonesia. It cannot train people in uh, a particular setting for, in, for three years as if it was the same as in any other country. I think it should, the training program should be developed by adjusting it to the conditions and the possibilities that exist at present moment in the country. Uh, there are now, of course, additional options which have been opened by uh, the, what we are doing now, by electronic communication and by lectures that are given to all by, uh, electronic means, because that is something where you can transmit a lot of knowledge. What is the most difficult part and should be given particular attention in the whole training of psychiatry is not so much the knowledge of the information, but the skills with which you operate in the psychiatric field. It is uh, how to approach the patient, etc., And this is very difficult to demonstrate in uh, electronic means, but it's possible. And I would suggest that an important contribution should be to development of, or simply taking some of the parts of the training that has been done, and which is now being recorded and uh, available at a low price, 
uh, for training uh, psychiatrists so that they can, after two or three years of training, which they are doing, they can benefit from the training of other countries, which has been recorded and which can, they can look in the evening when they're at home, they can see how training is being done in other countries. We have, for example, produced while I was uh, in WHO and later in WPA, we have produced a number of training modules which uh, can be, uh, which last an hour or three hours or two hours, which can be incorporated. These training modules are a little bit a compensation for the lack of teachers because the number of teachers is very small and it's a waste of time if a teacher speaks about schizophrenia. The teacher should speak about recognizing the disease. He should de demonstrate how to speak to a person with schizophrenia. He should uh, try to see how he can promote train, uh, treatment. But the elementary knowledge about schizophrenia should be learned from a book or from a program, a, 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 a recorded program, because that is facts. Facts should be basically taught by electronic means, while skills uh, and behavior should be taught by the experienced teacher. That's a big difference because until now, we have been depending on teachers to provide knowledge, uh, to provide facts, but the facts are all recorded now. They exist in films, they exist in books, they exist in other things, and they should not be the main topic of the training, uh, of the teaching. The main topic of the teaching should be the skills which a serious psychiatrist has in which he can demonstrate. How does he approach a person who is very excited? How do you do that? That is not something you can easily show in a book because, uh, or, in a, or, a, or in a film, but it has to be seen. And I think it's the change of the ways in which training is provided, which would be something that might be of importance. Thank you, Professor, for your perspective about to develop the education system to adjust the situation in Indonesia. Maybe, is there any from participant who would like to open mic or raise hand to us directly? Oh, okay, Dr. Leslie, you can. Yeah, uh, may I ask a question to Professor Norman? Okay. Yes, um, please. So uh, okay, so Professor, uh, I would like to know what are some of the ways that we can buy into the political will of local officials, because uh, from what I know that um, officials want to see the results of what they invest in. So one thing of one, I think of one way is that like doing the cost effectiveness, uh, effectiveness analysis, or are there any ways that we can show them that uh, the, this program is actually beneficial and it's worth to invest? Thank you, Professor. Well, most of the things in the world can be done by good human relationships. And I think one should think that my time, which I have uh, at my disposal, should be divided into several important parts. One part of the work of psychiatrists, one part of the time, is to establish friendships and collaborative relationship with other people who can be helpful, with government officials, with nursing staff, with uh, people in the community, etc. It should be an active part of building a network of collaboration because you cannot do everything alone. So that in fact, an important part of the psychiatrist's time should be the building of a network which will help him to do psychiatry. Uh, many of the things can be delegated, but in order to delegate, you must have two things. First, you must have a person to whom you are going to delegate. Now you're not going to get an extra person, so you have to recruit somebody who is already there. Maybe this is a government official or a nurse or a midwife or somebody whom you can, but you, in order to get them to be person to whom you can delegate, you must invest in making them your friend. You must invest in making them part of your extended team. They are not paid by you, but you can in fact very often get their help if they like you. If they feel that you are a person valuable who does his work well. And I think that that is, unfortunately, we feel that we should work for 12 hours in the hospital, but that's not very efficient because 12 hours in a hospital allows you only to see so many people who are there. If you have spent six hours in the hospital and six hours in going to people in the community, talking to them, 
finding friends, seeing maybe in a factory who wants to employ one or two people with mental retardation, a thousand other things. Having been the person who is the linkage person, who has links with other people, who want to listen to you and who respect you, that is an important task. We are not doing it sufficiently. So psychiatrist sits there, he works nine hours a day, he's tired and he has seen 50 patients. But uh, he could have seen 300 had he had people who, with whom he can send people to, uh, immediately, or if he had created the network which will be recipient for uh, people who have mental health problems. And I think that that's something that is of tremendous importance to include into the normal training, but also into normal work. As you work, think a little bit, who are all the people who in fact could help me? And then go out on a campaign to recruit them, to become your friends, to become your acquaintances, so that you can pick up the phone and say, I have a person with such and such a problem, can you help me? And the person in the ministry or in the local government or in the shop that is nearby, maybe they need somebody whom they will employ, will be able to help you and do much more. But that requires the network. Now, one other thing, a network is like flowers. Unless you water it regularly, it dies. So what does it mean watering uh, a network? It means you go to people, even when you don't need anything, you come to see them, you bring them a chocolate, or you smile at them, or you give them a book that you've just written, or any of the things, you feed the network so that they remain a live network that is supporting you. And in that network, you have a thousand hands because you're not alone, alone anymore. You're not the psychiatrist who sits there in the sweat all day long and sees patients. Because you can't see, after you've seen 40 patients, you're not working very well anymore. You're too tired. You're seeing, you're doing bad medicine. But if you could get rid of 30 of these patients by shifting them else into, the, into your network, you would have time to do much, much better psychiatry because you're then concentrating on you and what you can do best. Thank you, Professor, for the perspective. Is there any additional from Dr. Leslie? Is it enough? Uh, no, I, I think that, that's really uh, enlightening. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, Dr. Briastami, Prof. Chin, and also Dr. Leslie. And maybe we have one more. Oh, okay, Dr. Briastami, please. If I may add a um, question uh, for further discussion, uh, continuing Dr. Sati's question uh, previously, um, I think one of the issues uh, to help uh, the, uh, the education of, uh, of teaching uh, new psychiatrists or a consultant or subspecialty in psychiatrists, uh, from my understanding, is um, how, how is it different from Indonesia and other countries? From my understanding is uh, most of the other countries are hospital-based and in Indonesia it's uh, university-based. So uh, the implication uh, sometimes for the, uh, as it is a uh, university-based, uh, rather than being paid, if it's a, a hospital-based, uh, we have to um, save some money so we can uh, afford the education and also uh, if it is a uh, hospital base, maybe we have the uh, income and also we can bring our family. Uh, so that is some of the consideration that I think uh, hinder or prevent more psychiatrists in pursuing further education uh, as a consultant. Uh, I think uh, that is relevant to uh, what my experience is. Maybe Prof uh, Sartorius and also uh, Prof Chin has some insight on that. Is it, uh, is it our role as well as a young psychiatrist maybe to, uh, to do a further advocacy on that? Because not only uh, as it is in psychiatry uh, education, but also other specialty education uh, in Indonesia. Uh, maybe there's a role in us that maybe, I, uh, maybe there are some insight from Prof Norman and also Prof Chin. Thank you very much. To an extent, uh, uh, what I said about practice, building a network for practice, building a network for support when you do your work, is also true for education. 
you can infect if you have colleagues of your own age in other countries with whom you have a regular contact, you will learn about a number of things which they are doing. Nowadays, it's fairly easy to, to establish Zoom links and other things with training in all other sites. So that what is missing in your own training, which is based in one way, you can learn from others by adding. By, but in order to do this, you have to really think a little bit of uh, finding colleagues of your own age and your own seniority uh, in other places who will be able to respond to you and tell you. You can say, I'm really missing such and such and I cannot get it here. How could I get it? You will get advice from them. So that the network of uh, colleagues elsewhere must be, is also true for further education. Uh, now, I was, for example, uh, there are numerous opportunities which unfortunately are not used very often. For example, uh, we had a several of the uh, congresses, the World Congresses of Psychiatry, the uh, other congresses in other regional congresses, etc., which have offered fellowships. Now, I have uh, very often been surprised to see how few applicants there are. Uh, going to a conference is not only going to the conference, is also going to a place where there are people of your own age, your own experience, uh, who could become very good friends. There are older people, more senior people who can teach you something, but you can also establish a link with them, etc. But in order to, to go there, sometimes you cannot afford to do it on your own resources. But becoming a fellow, it could be. So I'm amazed that there are so few fellows who apply. I would say that majority of the people, it's not such a big deal being absent for three days if you know two years in advance that you have to be absent. Most of the people take holidays as well. So take three days holiday linked as a fellow for an international Congress or for an international setting. It's something that will offer you chances to get people to know people. And I think that uh, some of my colleagues have also now taken advantage of exchange of students. Uh, and exchange of psychiatrists. The Young Psychiatrists Organization in uh, the, of the WPA, for example, has an exchange program in which you can go for one month to another country and therefore somebody from the other country will come to Indonesia. I think that you should use these opportunities uh, because there are so many and uh, they, don't, they are not uh, expensive uh, because, the, for example, the exchange program is um, and, the, and the fellowship program is paying for your travel, paying for your hotel, paying for everything. Not everybody will be included, but as somebody said, you cannot uh, win a lottery unless you buy a ticket. And I think you should buy tickets for various lotteries. You buy a ticket for the lottery and the lottery is that you will get a fellowship in a wonderful Congress with fantastic movements, etc. But you have to buy a ticket for it. And it's not a train ticket. It's a ticket of writing a letter saying, I apply. Thank you, Professor, for your perspective. And maybe Prof. Jin will give another perspective, maybe. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. So yeah, this is also a very, uh, I mean, it's interesting question. Hospital-based, university-based. So maybe uh, the first issues I would like to uh, answer is whether it is hospital-based or it is university-based, uh, our training in Indonesia is a competency-based training. So if you are, I mean, is uh, 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 already, uh, I mean, is uh, 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 run your training and then you have the examination and then if it is uh, 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 said that you are competent, then you get certified uh, uh, even as a psychiatrist or being a subspecialty or a consultant. So I would like to, I mean, it's compared to other countries. So I know that um, we have some affiliation with, uh, for example, the University of Hawaii. So they also set up the child and adolescent psychiatry training. It is also the full two years training. So basically, even though they set up in the hospital-based training, it is also a full year, I mean, it's a full uh, 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 time training for two years. So I, when I was in a Boston Children's Hospital, it is also the hospital-based training. 
It is also the full-time training for two years to be a consultant and also the four years to be a psychiatrist. So I think uh, what we did uh, or what we do in Indonesia, it's not so different with other countries. Of course, uh, Professor Norman Sartorius mentioned about the fellowship for three days or a fellowship for two days or fellowship for a week or two months. It is a fellow basically, but not certified you are a consultant. Because when, uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, now we are talking about Indonesia. When we say that you are certified, then you need to do the certification. By mean, you need to do the examination. And then after it is, uh, I mean, is uh, 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 decide that you are certified, then you get the degree. So I think it's a bit uh, 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 different. Fellowship is not mentioned that you are consultant. Of course, fellowship you might be, I mean, is a, uh, 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 expert in one issues, but being a, a consultant, that that is a wide range of competency and also the clinical privilege that you need to, uh, I mean, is uh, uh, that give to you and for your practice. So that's why, I mean, is uh, 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 even though for the psychiatry training or the subspecialty in psychiatry training, there is a lot of, I mean, is consideration. So that is not an easy issue. So we would like to open here, open there is not uh, uh, easy that what we are discussing. So this is the first issue. The second issue you are mentioned about when you are working in the hospital, you get paid. And when you are doing the university based, then you need to pay. Yeah, this is the, I mean, it's, uh, 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 I cannot answer directly because this is the policy uh, in the, I mean, it's in this country. So when you are doing, uh, going to school, then we need to pay. So when you work in the hospital, then you get paid. So I think that might be a bit different between here in Indonesia and other Western countries. So when you are, I mean, it's being a resident, you get paid because you are, I mean, it's considered as one of the mem staff members in the hospital. Now, so hopefully in the new futures, when our country might have more budget in the, I mean, education or more budget for the hospital, I think it might be happen, these issues. So I think that is uh, one of my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your perspective. It's very hot discussion, I think. Maybe one of the, from the participant who will give another perspective, maybe Dr. Hervita or another participant, maybe. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Dr. Sela. Uh, our honor, uh, Prof. Norman Saturius, Prof. Chin, all of the colleagues, uh, thank you very much for having this, on this kind of a discussion. It is, this is a very important uh, regarding to the needs of the young psychiatrists. So based on the discussion with young psychiatrists, actually some of our uh, young psychiatrists really concerned about the, the skills that they, that they need for the practices which is even though we are talking about nine uh, uh, study program, which is coming from the nine center of the psychiatrics program, uh, studying program, we also really aware that uh, the standard is not uh, compared really well. I mean, some of the, the education centers maybe have a very good emphasis in psychotherapy, but not in some other part of the uh, centers. So. They, they really need uh, for further uh, skills uh, for being practices as a good psychiatrist for the community. So based on that discussion, and then also trying to find a new regulation, which is uh, preparing by our uh, medical colleagues. So that's an opportunity for developing fellows program. And then based on this fellow program, I guess, Prof. Jin, we also can develop such kind of a specific training with specific skills for young psychiatrists, which is they just, they, they really concern about how the way to give a best practice for the, for the community. And then, and we are, if we are thinking about the consultant that's based on the Indonesian regulation yeah, Prof. Norman, maybe this is not such kind of a regular term, which is uh, used uh, uh, globally or internationally. But if we are talking about consultants, so this is really related to the, the staff or the people who are working in the university or uh, trying to teaching people, even though not just only in the university, but also in the hospital, which is have a 
a collaboration with the university, we all realized that the number of staff in a university base is quite low. And then based on that, the ratio of the teachers and the student is sometimes it's very huge. So that's why we are thinking to have a collaboration with the hospital base. And then uh, regarding to the number of the patient, for example, we also thinking that there is a lot of uh, specific uh, skills that we can learn from the from the hospital. So if I mention about, for example, the Bogor Mental Hospital, uh, in, in my hospital, for example, in, in Chipto Mangkusumo, we have a very limited uh, experience, our opportunities to develop a rehabilitation center. And then we know exactly that some of the, the hospital, for example, like in, in Duran Sawit or Bogor Mental Hospital, they develop much about the about the rehabilitation center. So we need to collaborate with each other. And then based on that, I also inviting our colleagues from the hospital base to be a consultant, which is just also very important to, to uh, adding more values for the university because of that ratio that I've been mentioned before. So still trying to, uh, we still need to have a more, uh, more thoughts and then more observation and then more uh, trying to give us some sort of ideas about whether we really need for the consultant. Uh, I mean, like such kind of a, for the consultant term or do we really need for the specific uh, experience or specific skills that we need for the patients? So I guess this is also such kind of a, uh, and ideas here, Prof, to be thinking more by the Indonesian colleagues, whether this is, because some of us uh, maybe that don't have any much time to uh, to conduct a training. I mean, like that kind of a specialist training for the for the doctors, but in, in some other parts, uh, we really want to be part of the educational training to be a teacher or to be a lecturer for the specialist program. So we, we should uh, bring such kind of a broad or maybe more options for Indonesian uh, psychiatrists. So this is kind of an option that they can choose, especially our colleagues as a young psychiatrist. They want to become a fellows or they want to become a, a consultant uh, based on their uh, future uh, perspective or work that they really want to do. So I guess it's also that kind of a, a new development yeah, prof, uh, to be think for, for Indonesian colleagues. And then the other things that I want to raise is, uh, and also for Prof. Norman Sartorius, about the number of psychiatrists, Prof. When you mentioned about having more than 40 per, uh, patients a day, it's become such kind of uh, giving a bad uh, practice of a psychiatrist. In Indonesia, we face a lot of problems with that, Prof. Uh, we still have a more than six uh, province, province with the ratio of the psychiatrists and the population is more than uh, 500,000 people. So I can imagine that uh, one psychiatrist, they, they can uh, see the patient more than uh, 60 or maybe 80 uh, patients a day, inpatient and also uh, outpatients. So this is also such kind of a problem, Prof, uh, for people, for uh, young psychiatrists, how they can develop their skills. Uh, and then like what Dr. Sati mentioned, how they can uh, leave their, their profits for further training, uh, specific training or consultant. So that's, that's uh, the things that we face in Indonesia, Prof. So this also make us to think about um, having a more number of the the center of psychiatrists, especially in the in the islands, which is very far from Java, uh, and then trying to uh, give a, an experience or another experience for uh, improving the the medical doctors to or maybe such kind of a standing order from psychiatrists to to the medical doctors so they also can help us to giving uh, mental health uh, services to the community. 
that's the thing maybe that I want to share and then uh, give more some emphasis to the Stella. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herfita, for your perspective and very eye-opening for us. And maybe for the last one from Prof. Norman, do you have any additional perspective or no? Well, no, I think that what Dr. Jaffe said is that uh, remember, to remember the uh, relatively low number of uh, psychiatrists uh, who have to look after 200 million people. And I think that this should be a, a, a really a stimulus for seeking for solutions that have not been found elsewhere. Because many of the solutions that have been proposed, they are solutions in which the situation is much better. Uh, and I think that uh, Indonesia must have an Indonesian model of health care because it depends so much on the uh, culture and on the way in which you live and in which the society functions that the service has to be organized. It cannot be organized by some rule that has been produced somewhere. There are certain facts which must be taken into account. A particular medication must be given in such and such a way. That is a fact which cannot be changed. But everything else can be changed. Who will bring the tablet to the patient? Whether the patient can get it himself? Whether he needs a tablet at all, etc. All of these are things that must be decided locally. And I think we have learned in other countries that one of the important sources of learning how to organize services which are effective is to ask people who have the illness and ask their families how they want the service to run because they very often have wonderful ideas. And I think that one has to listen to them very carefully. And very often that is the solution for a situation which otherwise is not resolved. And also, once you come to these people to ask them for advice, they see you as a different person from the isolated doctor who sits up there. You are a friend of theirs. You are the key to something which they will get if they work together with you. So I think it's an important aspect that specificity of the situation and the solutions, which must be Indonesian solutions uh, and not solutions from anywhere else. In our global time, the problem is global. We know it's everywhere, but the solutions are local and they must be specific to the country. Thank you, Professor Sartorius, for your perspective. And thank you for all the speakers, professors, doctors, and also the participants. So interesting and so insightful from the presentations, from the response, from the perspective, and also the discussion. I think to conclude it, we have to collaborate with all sectors to contribute to uh, do the contribution in global mental health. And sadly, we reached the end of our event today. But before we close the meeting, I would like to ask all of the participants to open the camera to take photo together. And that will lead from the committee Please, Dr. Leo, to help us to take the photo together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheila, and also the speakers. So, yeah, you are invited to turn your camera on whenever possible and use the virtual background. And here we have five. So, stay still. Give your biggest smile. Okay. Uh, in one and two, one, two, three. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Next slide. One, two, three. Perfect. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Second. Okay. This is the last one. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you very much. I give we're back to Dr. Sheila. Thank you, Dr. Leo, Dr. Leo, for your help. And sadly, we also reached the end of the webinar series. So this third uh, webinar is the last part of the webinar series. And Thank you for all the professors, for the doctors and seniors who still join with us until this time. And I'm sorry for the any mistake. Thank you for your participation. Good night. Good evening, Professor Torius. And see you at the next event. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Professor you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Doctor. Thank <laughs> you.